Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for being here today. Uh, if you got your Bibles, I'll be over in 1 Kings 19. We'll camp out there again today. If you're a first-timer, thank you for being here. I would love to have the opportunity to meet you. If I haven't met you, I'll be uh, down front at the, after the service. Please come and say hello. Or if you've been coming for a while and I've had the chance to meet you, please come and say hello. I would love the honor of meeting you. You know, I'm not sure why, but I know that everybody struggles at some point with some kind of anxiety in our life. And a lot of times that does lead to depression. And I know about myself. I'm not that uh, man in my home that is that stable individual. I'm emotional. I run on highs and lows. I have that kind of addictive personality. Most of you know the way I was raised in a home of very athletic so you're supposed to be athletic, so that means you have to have a team that you always pull for. So I knew that it was really unhealthy in my life, and so as time progressed, I just began to pray and just, God, I don't want to be like that. Now, it, kill, it really bothers my wife and my two sons that I really don't have a team to pull for. Now, I pull for the Titans, but if they get beat, I don't get really uptight. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she's got three teams she pulls for. The Cowboys, because she's from Dallas. There you go, all right? or Texas A&M Aggies, where she went to school, and thirdly are the Titans. Now, if all three of those teams get beat in a weekend, I mean, on Tuesday, I'm looking at her going, why are you such in a bad mood? And I don't know if you've seen those Fansville commercials, those crazy fans. That's what she's like. She'll go, why am I in a bad mood? All my team's lost. That's why I'm in a bad mood. Quit asking me the question, okay? And so I understand that, but see, with my addictive personality is that there's some things that I'm really thankful for that God did in me that I had no control over. Number one, I hate the taste of alcohol. I just hate it, all right? As a matter of fact, when I sampled wine, I just used to go, can you put some Splenda in that or something? It's just bad, all right? But if I if I really like the taste of alcohol, is that, boy, I'd, I'd be a mess. Now, the other thing that I don't ever need to go near, and I've never, I really have never done this, but if I went near this, I would be in deep, deep trouble, and that is, if I ever got in that whole lifestyle of gambling or betting on sports teams, folks, I'd, I'd, I'd lose our house. And matter of fact, one, 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 we're, Sharon and I are on a cruise, and you know, if you're on a cruise, they make sure you walk through the casino. And so all of a sudden, I'm walking through, and all of a sudden, as I walk through, it's like I just became in a trance. And all of a sudden, I just stopped in front of the blackjack table. Sharon's holding my hand, and I'm standing there. I hadn't said a word. I'm just sitting there looking, and she knows what I'm thinking. I hadn't said a word, and she just goes, no. I said, "No, what?" She goes, "No, you're not. You don't. You're, you're not going. You're not going to sit down there and play." And I said, "I said just. I said just one hand, maybe two hands. No, no, no. You're not going to do this." And she said, "I have a better idea." And I said, "What's that?" And she goes, "Let's go back to our room." And I said, "That's a great idea. Let's do that." So, men, if you ever get that thought from your wife, for the sake of every man in the world, do not say no to that. All right. And the reason you don't say that no to that is because of that great theologian by the name of Lionel Richie, all right? Truly, I am in love with you, all right? So make sure that you know that. But you know, I don't know really what causes anxiety and depression in your life. And all of us, I think we've gotten to understand we, we all deal with it. But before we answer the question, I think we need to really ask another sobering question for all of us. And Okay, here it is, all right? Make sure we know this, all right? Number one is that, do we really want to get well? That's supposed to be on the screen, matter of fact, all right? So just so you know that. I'm just going to point it. There you are. Right? There it is. Right? Vanna White, there it is, all right? So do I really want to get well? Because I think a lot of times is that we, we talk about this, but we really don't want to get well. And we're, the reason we don't want to get well is because, see, when we don't want to get well because we usually excuse our depression and anxiety when we mask it with some kind of spiritual language or um, we struggle with it and it brings shame in our life, but yet we, we kind of wear it as a badge of courage because it brings attention to us and we really don't want to get well. But see, what happens is, is that once we have this anxiety and depression, what eventually is going to happen in your life is, is this is what Satan does, Okay the thing that he's going to bring in our life is what we're going to camp out and talk about today is that he brings this thing called shame in our life. And we wonder when shame sets in why we can't get this thing called anxiety and depression out of our heads. And so 
it started in the garden with a man having a choice, with a woman having a choice, and they chose. And because of what happened in the garden, we live in a broken world. We live, we live in a broken world. It's messed up. And this is what I will tell you is that ever since the garden, there are two kingdoms at place. Number one is the kingdom of darkness. And that is what is driven by the demon, by Satan and the demons of hell. And that is, he wants to make sure, Satan wants to make sure that not one person ever surrenders their life to give their life to Jesus so that they will be in hell for all of eternity. That's his ultimate goal. That's the goal that he's driving after. Now, once you give your life to Christ and even the spirit of God lives in you, he doesn't just back away. He continues to pursue you because he wants to make sure that you never experience this thing called abundant life in Christ. Now, so there's a kingdom of darkness, but also there's a kingdom of light. And that kingdom of light is that Jesus brings peace and freedom. And I think that we all really want this thing called peace, and I think we all want this thing called freedom. But at times, we don't want to pursue that because we really understand there is a cost for me if I really want peace and freedom. So the question is, how healthy do I want to be? And at times... This thing called anxiety and depression can be such an attention getter and we become so secure with it and then we get negative with our, our life and even if people speak against about the negativity in our life, we continue to live in it because we would rather to honor the anxiety and depression than we would to be and live in freedom and we don't want to pursue freedom in this thing called peace and when we don't pursue that, you can always know that shame is going to set in. And we've been looking at this great champion of God by the name of Elijah. And um, this guy by the name of Elijah, he was really was a part of God doing some of the greatest events ever, the most miraculous events. And one of them happened at Mount Carmel. It's where he challenged the prophets of Baal. And I mean, he won this incredible victory. And then the next thing that happens, the queen of the land, who is a wicked lady by the name of Jezebel, she comes after Elijah. She threatens him. At that point, you can see this pattern of Elijah, God's greatest champion that where anxiety sets in and then depression sets in and then the shame sets in. And we're going to see this. And so the shame that was produced in Elijah's life is the same thing that shame produces in our life. And that is, is that we are not good enough and what we do is not good enough. And that's where Elijah is. So 1 Kings chapter 19, we'll start with verse 3. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of the word of God? Elijah was terrified and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Now, at this point, he has been threatened and he is running. Anxiety has stepped into his life and he's living with it. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. Depression has become real now. I have, I've, I've had enough. You ever been there? Well, I just got I've had enough. Well, you're in great company today, all right? I have had enough. Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He replied, I've been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. I've done all this, and it wasn't enough. Shame now sits in with his life. So as we unpack this, the first thing that we're going to see here in just a minute is the pattern of shame. And you're going to see what exactly the enemy did in the life of Elijah is exactly the pattern of shame for our own life. So let's pray together. God, I pray today that uh, we'll see that the word is really applicable to every part of our life. And God, I pray that we can laugh together. I pray that our hearts will be challenged. And God, I pray, Lord, on my part, that I would just be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> please, please take some notes. And so the first thing that we're going to see is the pattern of shame. So as you see the pattern of shame, the first thing that you see is that Satan lies. That's where everything starts, all right? That's his nature. He can't help himself. He can't help himself but lie. Look what it says in John chapter 8, verse 44. It says this, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, 
for there is no truth in him. He can't tell the truth. Now, now the reason that he can't tell the truth is that he is completely opposed to everything that God is in your life. Everything that God is for us and for our life is truth because what does truth do? Truth sets us free. Guess what Satan does? He opposes the truth and therefore when he opposes the truth and gets us to oppose the truth, we live in darkness because there is no truth at all in the lies that he speaks to us about. And so he says, there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. So when you look at it, is that, what is he going to lie to us about? So we're going to go back to those three things on the screen, all right? First of all, we're going to say that, shame, that Satan lies. Now, don't go to the other two yet, all right? Because the premise of everything is that Satan lies and that he is going to speak to us. Now, what is it that he's going to lie to us about? He is going to lie to us that Christ is not enough for our lives. So we're going to do everything we can. We need something else. We're going to make sure that we're going to look for something else. We don't take the thought captive. And guess what happened? The second thing happens is that it drives us to, to participate in darkness, away from the things of God. And that can be anything, that whatever makes us feel good in the moment. It could be our, our diet. It could be not exercising. It could be things that we think about, our anger, our bitterness, our negativity. But let me tell you where his main drive is going to be. It's always his main drive. It's going to be about relationships. It's going to be about your close relationships. It's going to be about relationships that are not that close, but you still have relationships. Why do you think the enemy's always coming against your marriage if you're married? Because he wants to make sure that he drives us to participate in darkness. And please listen to me. Please, please, please don't miss this part today. The one area that he is going to attempt to drive us to do is to make sure that we participate in sex outside of marriage. And that includes pornography. And that's not just for men, that's for women as well. It's not just what you look at, it's what you read, it's what you listen to. And let me tell you, if you will live in that sin, can I tell you what will happen? Is that it will drive you to places that you never thought the enemy could ever take you. Because it is about bondage, it is about darkness. And what we don't understand is that that sin alone is the one sin that Paul separates from all other sin. It's the only sin that happens outside the body. So therefore, if we participate in it, the thing is, is that it is a drug that drives us. Now, what nobody tells us is, that sin that of sex outside of marriage, and that sin, what happens is, as we participate in darkness, it will drive us to anxiety and depression. And all this is driven by the enemy because when he speaks, he lies to us. And it will be about the premise. The premise is God is not enough. So we do whatever we can that drives us to do something that feels good in the moment. It started in the garden with Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. It says this, but, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. <clears throat> you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. Isn't it amazing how make sure that the enemy makes sure that how good sin looks? Boy, it looks good, doesn't it? It looks pleasing. Your eyes will be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, what would look good? And also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And when we think about this, everything is about this. You cannot trust God's integrity and you cannot trust God's goodness. Therefore, we participate in darkness, and it leads to the third thing, and this is it, is that the third thing is shame sets in. Now, when shame sets in, see, we don't think we can approach God, so therefore we don't. So this is what I want us to do, okay? I want everybody, we're going to read these three things. I want you to read them out loud with me, all right? So on three, we're going to read together. Everybody, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Satan lies drives us to participate in darkness, shame sets in. Read it again. Satan lies, 
drives us to participate in darkness, shame sets in. Read it one more time. Satan lies, drives us to participate in darkness, and shame sets in. Now, the fact is, is that once that shame sets in, can I tell you everything, those three steps, it will always be the same pattern of shame. When the shame sets in, now, all those, those three things, now it starts with Satan lies, but it's all going to culminate in one thing, and this is it, okay? This is what it leads to, is that we're driven back to the activity that produced the shame. It's, it's just a revolving door. And so it's a revolving door based on the premise of the lie, and we listen to it that Christ is not enough, and we cannot trust the integrity of God. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now I've come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Here it is. This is what Satan always does. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters. That's the thing that Satan does all the time in your life. He accuses you all the time. He never stops. And he says, who accuses him before our God day and night and has been hurled down. Satan is the accuser. He accuses and then what happens is that he, that we listen. Now, not only does he accuse, but he also consumes. First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And this is what happens. The demons come to you and they do what people do to us. Have you ever noticed when somebody comes to you and they whisper we lean in a little tighter because we think we're fixing to get information that nobody else knows. And so we lean in, listen. Can I tell you, Satan's not gonna scream at you. He's gonna whisper because he knows the way we are and he watches our activity so much and the demons fail, they'll just simply whisper. You know what they're usually gonna whisper to you? That's not fair. That's not fair. You know that's not fair. I mean, that couple, they got the same amount of kids of you that you do. And they have enough money to hire a nanny or a babysitter to go out on the town and go on a date and go to a movie and go out and eat, and you're stuck here with your kids. That's not fair. You know what? That's not fair. They don't even love God, and you love God, and you struggle in paying your mortgage they don't struggle in paying their mortgage. Probably they even got the mortgage paid off. Oh, he whispers, and we listen. You know what? They've got two kids that you can't even get pregnant. Oh, because you're lying. Guess what? They're married and you're still living for God and the principles of God and you're still not married. Oh, guess what? Your husband made a mistake and left you. You're left alone. Your wife left you. You're alone. Guess what? He made a mistake. You have a right to hold it against him. She made a mistake. You have a right to hold it against her. Oh, my goodness. How he whispers and how we listen and he lies to us. And so we participate in the darkness. And guess what the participation is? Guess what he drives us to? Because, see, the enemy's always going to move you. He's never going to leave you. He's never just going just to whisper to you and lie to you just so that you listen. No, he's going to move you somewhere. And when we listen long enough, guess what he moves us to? Bitterness. C.S. Lewis says it best. The greatest tool in the enemy's toolbox is bitterness. If he takes you there, you'll live in anxiety and depression you never thought was possible. See, you look at what happened in the life of Elijah. The enemy spoke. Jezebel spoke, and he listened. And he, listened. he didn't take the thought captive. And the darkness that he participated in was he ran. He had forgotten about God's faithfulness. He had forgotten how God had come through. He doubted God's integrity and he doubted God's goodness. And the shame sets in. He gets in a cave. He wants to die. And guess what he does? What a picture of us. He quits approaching God. And then he's driven back to the activity 
when he was confronted, I'm the only one standing for Jehovah God. And he wasn't, and he knew he wasn't. And we see this thing, this pattern of shame, and we listen to the enemy, and we get confused. And we think there is such a problem. And somebody says something to you. And let me tell you, even if somebody says something to you, and this is where we get confused, we think if somebody says something to you, to us, it's, it's that person. And you know what Scripture says? No, they're not, the, they're not the issue. It's all driven by the enemy of darkness. It's that we're just listening to it. And so we see the pattern of shame. But the second thing we see is the process of healing. So how do, we, how do we begin to heal through this thing called anxiety and depression and that where shame sits in? How do we move through that? Well, several things here, right? So the first thing in, in the process of healing is, is that we need to make sure that we are looking back. You know, the root for Elijah, what if Elijah, you know, what if it would have been that, okay, I, I, I've done this, I've obeyed God. But you know what? It didn't turn out like Elijah thought it would. What if he would have looked and said, you know, I've obeyed God. I've done everything God told me to do, and it didn't work out. I really thought that the king and the queen, the wicked people, that they would repent and turn to God, and they didn't. What if Elijah would just say, you know what? I'll look back. It's not a big deal. I've done my part. But see, we don't do that. And so most of the time is that we carry shame for, for, for things that are not our fault at all. We feel like there's something wrong with us because we can't work through shame of something in our life, maybe in the past or even right now, even in the present. We can't work through the shame because we can't even forgive ourselves. And yet when we look at this, is that there's things that you're not even responsible for. Elijah wasn't responsible for the fact that, that the king and the queen didn't repent. That wasn't on him. He just was supposed to obey God. But also there are things that we are responsible for. There are things that cause traumatic events in our life. In the book, The Body Keeps Score, here's what the author says. Trauma is not just an event that took place sometime in the past. It is the imprint left by that experience on mind, brain, and body. Some of you right now, you're experiencing a drama from your past or even your present, but you're experiencing a trauma in your life that you didn't cause. You had nothing to do with it. Now, there's right now, there's some of you that are experiencing some trauma because you were involved in a traumatic event that you did participate in. But whether you participated in or whether you did not, you're trying to move forward. And as you are trying to move forward, what takes place is that you have to understand this. This traumatic event, it might cause sadness in, in your life for the rest of your life. I'm just going to be honest with you and tell you that. But it doesn't mean that we can't move through that. And so as we look back, we have to understand that a lot of our shame, it has to do with our family. There's been a generational sin that maybe that you're having to live with that has been caused by your family. Maybe the generational sin of adultery, maybe divorce, pornography, alcoholism, drug abuse, negativity, bitterness, anger, gossip. It was given to you, and as it was given to you, it's just become a way of life for us. But so much of the reason that we deal with this anxiety and depression and the shame of it is because of our families, and that's the reason that we need to look back and to see that. So let me give you this, all right? Whether we know this or not, families imprint us more than we realize. Now, most of you know, I've shared this with you, had been a secret that I'll share with you about my own competitive nature that I was raised in. And so, in that, guess what? You win at all costs, at all costs. And so, you win at all costs, and now your competitive nature, and guess what happens? Just in God's sovereignty, Sharon and I had kids. And so, the first one, our oldest one, Darian, is that she began to participate in our first athletics, and that was 
She played in the girls' softball league when we lived in Nashville at one other time. She played in the girls' softball league in Donaldson. Now, it was a coach pitch. It was a great league. Now, in that league is that the coach pitch, and you got five pitches. Now, if that coach doesn't throw a strike, you better swing at something because you got five pitches, and that's five pitches, you're going to the dugout, all right? So we're playing the best team. I can still see it. I can take you to the field I was on. I was a third-base coach. That coach grooves three pitches right down the middle. The bat has not come off Darius' shoulder. I go crazy. I am the third base coach and my daughter's batting, and I start screaming, what are you doing? Get the bat off your shoulder and swing the stupid bat. That was before that people had cell phones and they would video you as you're doing stupid things on the ball fields like some of you do all the time, right? That was way before that. And so all of a sudden, fourth pitch comes, it's nowhere close. It's outside, it's high, and she reaches up and she swings and hits it. It goes over the first baseman's head, goes down the line. She gets a double. And I mean, that child, she could always run like the wind. She gets to second base and we get back in the car. And I said to her, I said, hey, why did you swing at such a bad pitch? Because I was so tired of you embarrassing me and screaming at me. That's why. You know, men, when your wife looks at you and you know you've really messed up and she doesn't say anything and you wish she would say something, but you know you've really messed up, you know, I knew I messed up. And so that night I said to her, I said, I'm so sorry. I just blew it. Guess what, though? There's another game coming. I got no choice to make. And see, what happens with so many of us is that that was all pretty much driven in my life, starting out with, by my dad. When do we grow up and be big girls and big boys and we put our britches on and go, it's my stuff, I need to deal with it? Looking back, we need to identify how we deal with money, conflict, sex, Grief, loss, anger, feelings, emotions, even successes and failures. But we have to move forward. You can't stay there. So we're looking back. The next thing is we talk about is going forward. So I'm going to give you three things about moving forward, all right? So here we go. Moving forward, number one, first, moving forward is possible. I've been really open and honest with you. I admit that I have anxiety, I have depression, and yes, I have at times shame that I thought, you know, I'm not good enough. In my darkest days of anxiety and depression, you have no idea how close I was to walking away from this completely because of my shame. And yet, we have to look and say, you know what? To move forward, we have to understand that our trauma is real, but that the Holy Spirit is more. And the Holy Spirit in us empowers us to understand that I have shame, I'm dealing with it, and it's okay that shame, even at time, causes us to be sad. You just gotta keep moving forward. And so the enemy continues to whisper about our shame. And this is what the enemy knows about every individual, okay? Don't miss this, all right? This is worth coming for, okay? Number one is that you are a threat to darkness. And you might be right now, you're not even close to walking with Jesus. You might say, I'm a Christ follower, but man, I'm living in sin. I ain't doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I am, I'm living in this sin. I can't overcome that sin. Here's what the enemy knows. As long as the spirit of God lives in you, you can always bet on it. Go to bed tonight. This will buy pies at the fair. Take the money to the bank and bet on it. The one thing you can know is that you are a threat to darkness and the enemy knows it and he's always coming after you. But also, he also knows you're an ambassador for light. We are the ones to, to, be, to move forward. Why are we able to move forward? Number one, because of the character of Christ and that Christ lives in me. And guess what scripture says? That Christ in us is the hope of glory. Look what it says in James chapter one, verse 17. 
It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We look at that and we say, every perfect gift is from above. We're so driven for money, we go, oh, that's what it's about. It's about money. It ain't got nothing to do with money. It's about everything in your life, especially the Spirit of God that lives in you, because the greatest gift that you got from above is when you surrendered your life to Christ and the Spirit of God came to indwell you. That's the greatest gift you ever got. And so when you got that gift, we understand is that he doesn't change. And we know that we can deal with the anxiety, the depression, and the shame that it causes. What if Elijah had said, again, you know what? Man, I just obeyed God. That rest of that craziness, that's up to those jokers. I ain't got nothing to do with them. You know what? If you want to die and go to hell, that's on you. It ain't on me. He never said that, though. He just continued to live in the shame. So number one, moving forward is is possible. The second thing is that we need to be honest and learn to forgive. First of all, forgiving yourself. Again, there's an event in your life that took place. You had no control over. And it wasn't even done to you. It 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 was done to somebody around you that you were really close to. And yet there are some of you that it was done to you. And I'm going to tell you, there's some of you today, your hurt is so deep because it's from a family member. Maybe a spouse. Maybe a mom or dad. Maybe a grandparent. But let me tell you, don't minimize the hurt. It was done to you. There, there was great hurt. Don't, don't just act like, oh, it wasn't a big deal. That's what stupid men usually do. That's what we do so well. Don't, don't minimize the hurt. Assign appropriate responsibility. And once that happens, we begin to process this thing called forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean absolving those who've hurt you or even having a relationship with them. This is where we get stuck because we're never promised reconciliation. You're just called to forgive. Now, and it's about releasing to God. Once you see this, forgiveness is about the past. Trust is about the future. And I know some of you are deeply hurt because of what was done to you. Right now, they're sitting next to you. You don't want to say it, but they're sitting next to you. Maybe it's a family member. Trust God with that. I'm not, I'm not going to sit up here and be the pastor, so it's all going to work out. We, I don't know that. But I do know that we can trust God with it. Some of you right now, you know you have made a choice and your choice hurt somebody in your family. I'm not talking about a bad choice. I'm talking about a choice that you had to make. It was the right choice. It was the right choice. You sought counsel about it. You prayed about it. You knew it was driven by truth, but you made a choice with somebody in your family. And can I tell you, they're still hacked off of you. If I wasn't preaching, I'd use another word right now, but they're that, all right? And can I tell you, 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 you cannot just free you. You need to move on. Don't just tr- trust God for the future and trust God with them. Look what it says in Psalm 37, 3. This is a great verse y'all to memorize here, all right? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Ooh, that's so good, ain't it? Dwell in the land. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Now, the third thing I'm going to give to you, I'm going to introduce it, but you have to come back next week to get this one, okay? So here it is, all right? The third thing, we draw near to God and rely on him more deeply. Now, why do I draw near to God? Why do, do I do that? Now, I'm going to give you three things. Maybe I should have put these on the screen, but they're not on the screen, all right? So here you go. Number one, you have to understand because I have a purpose we have a purpose. You and I, we have a purpose. Why? Because the moment that we were born, all right, at that point, we are spiritual beings. That doesn't mean we have a relationship with Christ. But once we give our life to Jesus, you can know you have a purpose beyond yourself, and that is what God wants to do in your life. You have a purpose. Don't forget that. The second thing, though, is this, is that why do I draw near to God? Because I want to be healthy. You know what? That might include medicine. 
for anxiety and depression. And what I said the very first week, I want to repeat. Jesus is not in competition against your medicine. Please don't walk out of here and go, you know what? If I just had enough faith, I'd get off my medicine. Don't be crazy, okay? Don't do that. Get with somebody that knows a whole lot more about you than you do and about your issues. But we want to be healthy. But let me tell you what I've said. You might get on medicine, but please listen to me. That's not going to heal your soul. Only Christ can do that. And the third thing I want to say to you is this, because I choose to keep moving. I love King David. He was a warrior. He was a worshiper. He was passionate. He ran on highs and lows. He wasn't that even guy. He wasn't. But oh my gosh, what a heart for God that guy had. He dealt with so much anxiety and depression. Over two-thirds of what he, what, he, what he wrote about was his depression and his, and, and his anxiety. But can I tell you what you see about David? He just kept moving. He knew about Christ. He knew about God. He knew about the character of God. He knew that God was able. But you see David say things like, I choose to take refuge. I trust. I call out. I cried out. I hope for it. And I even, let's get this, I even choose to be glad. Boy, do I need to hear that today. Let me tell you, this whole thing is wrapped up in your relationship with Jesus, and it starts with you choosing to make a decision to give your life to Christ. You don't choose that, you're never going to have freedom, ever, ever, ever. So I want to encourage you, I would implore of you, Make that decision to give your life to Jesus today. Let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes if you would.